welcome everybody to um, the last session of risk management and insurance. Um, this particular session is going to highlight risk, your risk management plan, um, where we look at specifically letters of engagement. Um, and we're going to look at what specific protocols and procedures need to be in place um, for purposes of your practice. We're also going to uh, close off um, this particular session with looking at the assignment and looking at um, and providing some guidance as to what um, you should uh, consider when drafting your assignment. Um, so I'm going to move on to the slideshow. Okay. Okay, so we're now looking at the risk management plan and what do we need to have in place um, in order to have a good and effective risk management plan. But before we go into the nitty gritties, it's important to understand why a risk management plan and a risk management plan in essence is going to ensure that you minimize any of the identified risks in your practice. It's also going to include measures um, that you want to implement in your internal procedures in order to uh, reduce risk. And you need to be aware that each practice is going to have its own unique risk management plan. So in summary, risk management does three very important things. One is that a good risk management plan is going to protect your reputation. If you have a good risk management plan, you're going to have good procedures and good protocols in place, and this essentially will reduce the risk of you facing any sort of claims by your clients. It's going to protect your pocket, because if you're going to not have good protocols in place, and this leads to claims against you, um, be it misappropriation claims, be it PI claims, whatever the case may be, it's going to harm you in harm you on a financial level. You're going to have to pay higher premiums if you're going to get um, if you're going to seek top up insurance. You're going to have to pay deductibles. You may be exposed in your own personal capacity if claims exceed your primary layer of insurance and you don't have any top up cover in place. And finally, is that risk management is going to protect your client. Essentially, your clients are the lifeblood of your firm. So it is important that we have good protocols in place in order to ensure that their interests are always safely protected. So it is very important that you follow these four steps. Number one is that you must design a risk management plan. Once your plan has been designed, you must implement your plan. You must then ensure that this particular plan is complied with, that you adhere to the protocols that you put in place and that they operate effectively. And once that happens, the plan needs to be constantly monitored. You must ensure that you go back and check that the plan is um, is updated, that it's up to date, that it um, consists of all the relevant um, information and relevant protocols uh, consistent with what your practice does. So from my experience, um, risk management, uh, you know, just basically from the claims that I've seen, um, my conclusion is that it's not necessarily a lack of legal knowledge on the part of practitioners that leads to professional negligence claims, but rather just a basic non-adherence to to office management procedures. So I think this is very comforting to know that we, as attorneys and as practitioners, we have the requisite knowledge and skill. However, when looking at many of these claims, I just find that there is an absence of layers of engagement. There is an absence of just simple processes and protocols. And had these been in place, many of these claims um, could have been avoided against practitioners. So I think it's important that as a practice, you do some sort of introspection 
um, and you look at your protocols because we find that many claims result from just pure lack of supervision, lack of a good diary system, lack of having a dual diary system, registering with prescription alert, um, a general lack of internal controls, a failure to have office procedures in place and a failure to adhere to those office procedures if they are in place. We also find that many attorneys take on instructions where they lack the relevant skill and experience. So for instance, where an attorney is not a conveyancer, but accepts a conveyancing instruction and then gets somebody else to attend to it on his behalf. If something goes wrong, the buck stops with you as the attorney. So be very specific as to what, it, what instructions you're willing to accept. And then often um, we find that many claims are resulting from a failure to obtain proper, correct and clear instructions. So onto the risk management plan, and it is very, very important that this risk management plan is not just a figment of your imagination. It has to be a clearly drafted document and it must be in writing. This particular risk management plan that you draft for your particular firm needs to form part of your standard operating procedures internally. So let's look specifically at letters of engagement. What does your letter of engagement need to contain and why should we have one? So a letter of engagement defines the relationship between an attorney and his client. It will completely address the scope of the instruction that you have received from your client. It will detail um, all relevant um, uh, uh, issues in, in the layer of en engagement uh, with regards to your fees, um, with regards to um, terminating mandate, with regards to documents that, can, that are required. So this letter of engagement can be tailor-made. It can be tailor-made to suit your particular practice and the type of matter that you are engaging on. All the terms contained in your letter of engagement must be explained to your client. There must be um, a meeting of the minds with regards to what is contained in the letter of engagement and what is required from the client and what you will be required to do. It will serve as a record if ever a dispute arises. So in terms of um, Section 35A of the LPA, it, it provides that um, an attorney must provide a cost estimate to his client um, at the outset with regards to the matter, with regards to the instruction received. Now, this is very, very difficult because when you receive an instruction, it is always difficult to guesstimate or even estimate what the costs are going to be. But it is important to articulate to your client what the costs will be, and then you can always amend this as the matter progresses. We know that matters can take on a life of its own and therefore you can revisit this. It can be a living document and it can be something that can be amended. But before you even draft the letter of engagement, it is my suggestion that you answer two very pertinent questions. And that is, number one, do I really want this client? In answering this question, you need to ascertain whether in fact your client has reasonable expectations. So if your client approaches you and they have been in a motor vehicle accident and they've suffered orthopedic injuries and if their expectation is to get five million rand from the RAF, then it is at this point that you need to curb your client's expectation. If you don't and if they don't get that payout as they've expected, it may lead to a claim. It may be a frivolous claim. It may be an unsupported claim. However, it is a nuisance claim that you're going to have to deal with. So always curb your client's expectations. Ask yourself the question, am I the first attorney that he's instructing? We often find that claims arise when a client moves from one attorney to another. Now, the fact that a client has been to three other attorneys and then and then he finds yourself at, he, at your doorstep is not necessarily a flattering um, position. 
it could necessarily be that this particular client is actually quite a difficult individual. So you need to consider whether in fact you, you want to accept this instruction. You also need to ask yourself the question as to whether you're in a position to figure the, the client, whether he has the necessary information to satisfy your requirements in terms of FICA. Also, you need to understand in what capacity is the client instructing me? Is it in a representative capacity on behalf of, for instance, a company, or is it in a personal capacity? So you need to understand who and in what capacity they, they're instructing and who am I accepting the instruction from and what authority does that particular person have? The second question that you perhaps need to ask answer is, do I really want this matter? And in answering that question, you need to understand whether in fact you have the necessary expertise to deal with the matter, to deal with the instruction that you have received. Do you have the resources to deal with the matter or are there any time constraints um, that may be applicable? So if, for instance, you have a five week trial and it's consuming a lot of your time and a client comes, comes in to see you and his claim prescribes the following week, will you be able to ensure that his claim and the, the, the issuing of the summons, is the, the time period for issuing and service of the summons will be done timelessly considering um, the fact that you are you are busy with, with the trial at the moment. So you need to understand that position. Also, ask yourself the question is, am I being pressurized into accepting a matter? Um, often attorneys take on instructions from family and friends, and this sometimes can be could have disastrous effects. So you need to be clear as to whether in fact you want to accept um, an instruction from family and friends. So what should your letter of engagement contain? Your letter of engagement should contain, and, I, and I've listed a few things which I think would be pertinent to a letter of engagement, but you can draft your own letter of engagement that is tailor-made to your practice. It could contain who are the parties, so the details of the parties. What is um, your billing requirements? When are you going to bill them? What is your fee structure? Do you require a deposit? When is the deposit uh, needing to be paid by? Um, deposits that are made, should it be invested? You need to document what is the scope of your instruction. So what am I required to do in terms of this matter? Um, would we need to appoint counsel? Would counsel be required and the extent that counsel will be required? You also need to include who will be dealing with this matter. Am I? as the director of the firm going to be dealing with the matter? Is it a matter that is capable of being dealt with by an associate, by a candidate attorney? So who exactly is going to be dealing with this matter? You also may wish to include timeframes. So in other words, how long the matter uh, will, will possibly take. You also may want to include who is the person that is providing you with the instruction and does he have the necessary authority um, and understanding and procuring all the information in this regard. Um, you also need to include if it's subject to a contingency fee agreement. And it's very important that you consider the rules with regards to contingency fee agreements and consider the Contingency Fee Agreement Act in this regard. So please um, consider this as and, and maybe consider it as well for the purposes of your assignment. Also look at conflicts of interests. It may You may want to include something with regards to confidentiality, um, any of the FICA requirements, what documents you require from your client in order to meet your FICA requirements. It may contain a dispute resolution clause and a termination of agreement clause. When entering into a mandate agreement or a, um, a letter of engagement with your client, it is imperative that you have an understanding of what the regulatory requirements are in this, in this regard. As a company, you also need to ensure that you have a standard operating procedure. Now, 
every practice has its own preferred systems and procedures, and this is known as your standard operating procedures. When drafting your standard operating procedures, you need to be ensure that your company's mission statement is at the forefront of your mind when drafting it. And you need to also focus on the role of your employees. Always remember that your standard operating procedures must be reduced to writing. Your, your staff must be trained on it and it must be readily available to the staff. So there is no issue. So they understand what is contained in, in, in the standard operating procedures. And if they digress and if there is any issue, you can refer back to it and they can be sanctions for non-compliance. So what should be contained in general in your standard operating procedures? It should contain, for instance, rules relating to the, the relationship with the regulators, with your colleagues and the public. It should contain, and this is a big, big issue, and that is social media. Um, I find many standard operating procedures are silent or social media is absent in their, in their SOPs. This is a, a, a huge, you know, this is the way the world is moving, where social media is becoming increasingly um, uh, popular. Uh, so you need to reference this in your standard operating procedures. It it it, it brings me back to a matter um, that was um, uh, the, uh, a matter relating to a candidate attorney um, that started at a a big firm, and on the first day of her employ, she got to her office and there was a pile of files on her desk, and very innocently she took a photo or a selfie of herself with the files in the background and she said, welcome to the first day at the office. And in the background, on the top of the files were two companies that were in a dispute. It wasn't um, out in the open. There wasn't public knowledge of this particular dispute. And this particular photo went viral. Um, and obviously she was suspended because of this particular photograph. Now, you need to ensure that you have rules relating to this. Um, also, do you want your, um, your, 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 your staff to be posting things on a social platform, um, considering that they, on, their, on their bio, they, they are associated with your practice? Um, so you need to have some rules and you need to have a thought about a think about this. Do you have any rules with regards to telephone and court etiquette? Um, dress codes. Is your staff required to dress in a certain way? Written communications. Um, I think this is a big, big, big one. Um, I often uh, and I mean, I look at files on a daily basis um, from attorneys and I find that there is no consistency with regards to to the files that are that are given to me. Um, I get letters that are drafted in an aerial font and another one drafted in a Calibri font. So in my, my view, you have to have something standard and uniform and all communications need to be drafted in a certain way. It basically talks a lot about your firm and the professionalism of your firm. So there must be some sort of standardization and this can be contained in your standard operating procedures. Staff meetings, um, etc. You must include the rules relating to the first consultation. Um, do you have certain conflict checks? What are the FICA requirements? Um, do you have an information sheet that needs to be completed? Your engagement letter, your letters of engagement or your mandate letters will form part of this. Um, and this should be included and how you wish your staff to complete the letter of engagement. Um, you may want to include things on billing, how frequent you're going to communicate with your client, um, rules relating to how to open a file, how to close a file. Okay, then we look at trust account management rules. Now, this is very important, and in this regard, it is important that you consider rules 54 and 55 of the Legal Practice Act. You may want to consider um, Rule 54.14.7 of the LPA, which specifically deals with the internal controls when it comes to trust account management, um, which basically deals with um, implementing internal controls um, and how to comply and in, in, in the compliance with those rules. Um, it looks at 
and addressing uh, controls or designing controls to address identified risks in your practice. Um, it basically looks at the implementation of these rules as designed, um, whether it's operating effectively, whether they are being monitored. So rule 54.14.7 is something which is very, very important. Um, and it's very important as a practice that you consider this and also very, very important for purposes of your assignment as well, that you have a look at the at, at, at what it com what, what it contains. Um, it's also important that you design and implement a proper protocol and procedures to deal with management of your trust uh, of your trust account. Um, you need to have what are the rules, for instance, if there is a shortfall of trust monies, what are you going to do in, in, in those instances? If there is a scenario where there has been misappropriation of trust funds, what are the protocols and procedures applicable there too? Um, do you have any rules with regards to separation of duties or segregation of duties? Um, so the person who requisitions and an invoice cannot possibly be the same person that will sign off and pay it. So there has to be some sort of um, a separation of duties. Um, there must be supervision uh, in place. There must be uh, checks and balances in place. There must be perhaps a peer review system in place. Also note that there are different rules for an incorporated practice. Um, and this regard, I think it is uh, rules 34.7 that deals with the issue of liability and, and, and 54.19 that you may wish to consider um, that is relevant for an incorporated practice. Um, it is important, as I said, that you must have segregation of duties, the segregation of accounts. Um, and this will um, assist in combating misappropriation or payments to incorrect beneficiaries as well. Right, so this concludes our risk management um, risk management and insurance uh, presentation. I hope that um, that you enjoyed it. I hope that there are certain aspects that you could take out and perhaps implement in your own practices. I hope that it will make you better functioning practice practitioners um, and and um, limit any risk that 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 might that, that you may face. So in closing, I just want to go through the assignment question and the assignment question is divided into four different questions. Um, please can I ask that you read and consider the questions carefully. Um, it is important that you answer each question separately and that you mark each question. So question one, question two, question three. If it's question 4.1, you reference 4.1 and you answer 4.1. Remember that you need to canvas the question in detail. So if you're going to answer the question, question one in a half a page, you may not necessarily meet all the requirements for purposes of fully answering question one. Um, it is also very important that you include a bibliography or footnotes in your assignment, just so that you can acknowledge the sources that you've um, that you've used. Oh, very important that you plan the structure of your assignment. Um, your assignment needs to be logical. Um, and it needs to deal with the aspects of that question in detail. Um, everything in the assignment has been canvassed during the course of these lectures. We've touched on it, we've discussed it. Um, consider the um, these uh, the particular presentation, consider your, your notes as well. You may wish to look at the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund. Um, the Legal Practitioners Fidelity Fund may be relevant. You may wish to consider the Legal Practice Act, the Contingency Fee Act, FICA. Um, uh, yeah, so those are, are the few uh, are a few sources that you may wish to consider. Um, you may wish to consider some case law, and I think the most relevant and pertinent case law was covered during the course of these sessions. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think that 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 covers the assignment. Um, I wish you all the very best in, in, in the assignment. Um, it's not particularly difficult as long as you just consider it in detail and canvas each question separately and thoroughly. Okay. 
all the very best um, and I hope you um, successful in your practices and successful in your assignment. Thank you.